Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst, and today I'm speaking with Andreas and Vijay, the two co-founders of Fileverse. Fileverse is um, a super interesting project that leverages in, uh, existing infrastructure that kind of lets you use it as an um, on-chain Google Docs sort of like product. But we'll hear all about this in in just a second. Um, before we talk um, with Andreas and Vijay, um, we'd like to tell you about our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Andreas and Vijay, I am so happy to have you on Epicenter this week. Same. Excited to hear. Hey, Frederike. Thank you for having us. Uh, very happy to be uh, to be here. Super cool. Tell me about yourselves. Um, so, who are you? What's your background? What makes you get up in the morning? And maybe I'll start with Andreas. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, just one quick thing. Also, we're honored to be here uh, after the celebration of the ten years uh, of Epicenter. Uh, we watched the live stream yesterday. It was very cool. I can't believe it. it's been 10 years already. I think I'm, I've been a listener since half that time. Yeah, yeah really crazy. <laughs> um, uh, also, I was going back in the initial episodes and I saw that even in 2014, you had, you had an episode on meme coins uh, with a Kanye mm -hmm. fish uh, uh, coin, which is hilarious. You see that CT hasn't evolved uh, that much. <laughs> um, so, sorry, uh, back to the question. So, yes, I'm Andreas. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of, uh, of Fivers. I am um, I'm also a PhD student. I'm finishing my uh, PhD at the moment at the University of Oxford. My focus there uh, is specifically on human control of AI systems in uh, hacking operations, so uh, what we call computer network exploitation uh, and attack. Um, it's something that uh, I'm quite passionate about, and yet uh, I see it as, you know, secondary to a lot of the work that we do at uh, Falvers, uh, and in some sense quite complementary as well. So we always have great conversations about that uh, within the company. Um, why do I wake up in the morning? Uh, so I think what drives me is... Uh, first of all, as a proper uh, Greek kid, uh, to to buy a house for my mother uh, is the first uh, answer, <laughs> and uh, the the second answer is that, um, and I think this is something quite common in the in the team, we are aggressively, maybe naively, 
um, optimistic about the impact that we can have uh, on the world. Um, I hope it doesn't sound too EA-like, but we, we really want to have direct uh, impact on uh, things that we consider very problematic for the way people communicate, collaborate, uh, and live together. So most of our work is dedicated to that. Cool. I'll come back to that in a second, kind of why you think these uh, th these areas are problematic. But maybe for first, Vijay, um, what about you? Who are you? Uh, yeah, uh, I am uh, like mainly you can say that out of uh, Andres and Constantin, I fill in the tech gap. <laughs> and uh, if you think about it uh, from the perspective of how, what do I associate with and what, what is it that excites me most, it's how can we use different kind of technologies that exist like out there and how can we make it fit into the users like uh, you know how can we make a connection between the users and the tech like and how can we bridge the gap between uh, those two things so uh, that's the like general uh, thing which excites me in, uh, for either experimenting with different things for building different things and I like like in general to uh, create s small softwares or small things that uh, increase either the interactions or the efficiency in general for people that are doing things on top of them. So, yeah, I know it's sort of a techie pitch. <laughs> so you, you're the tech co-founder, Vijay. Yeah. But I also heard that um, there's uh, there's uh, not just Andreas, but there's also Constantine. So there's three co-founders. Tell me about Constantine. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say the first part. You can uh, you can complete in uh, a VJ. Uh, I think you can only hear good stuff from us uh, about Constantine. So he's the eldest one in the in the, um, the co-founder uh, group. He won't like that. Um, he's uh, <laughs> someone that's been in crypto since around 2016. I think his uh, his main specialty until Fiverr was really doing product uh, marketing and getting a lot of non-crypto people to get interested in crypto. He ran the most uh, the most uh, popular by by measure of uh, audience uh, crypto campaign in the world. Um, so with the Economic Times of India, uh, over 150 million uh, uh, readers. And um, and he's someone that right now at Favors makes sure makes sure that things happen. You have VJ and us and and me who are you know uh, going all over the place, uh, generating ideas uh, every time that we talk. And Constantine takes all that, canalizes it, uh, focuses it around clear objectives, and makes sure that you know both VJ and I know that. You know, we're 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 developing something bigger than just a side project that excites us. Uh, we're developing something that has users, that has people depending on it, and uh, yeah, he he's really the the person that manages to organize the whole team, which is also why he's the the CEO at uh, Fabus. Yeah, every company kind of needs that sort of person, otherwise things don't get done. Um, how did how did you three meet? Uh, yeah, so me and Constantine, like we worked at a crypto company for like I think uh, for four or five years, and that's how that's where we met and we uh, understood that okay, we are excited about uh, common things. And one of the thing like which uh, Andres was saying about the uh, crypto campaign which Constantine had done, like it was uh, me and him, like we were organizing. Uh, that that uh, thing and uh, uh, that's how me and Constantin met and uh, like after that Constantin introduced me to Andres and it has been like a crazy story uh, maybe Andres can add on the uh, like the moment when we shared the POC of Fileverse first <laughs> as an anecdote yeah yeah it, it's uh, it's very funny I'll, I'll reveal something on the podcast but uh, I met my I met Constantine through my mother because he's my brother. Uh, he's uh, <laughs> he's my uh, older brother, and um, we were back in Christmas at home in Greece. And he tells me, "Hey, dude, 
look at this. Uh, and he opens up uh, an email and it's an email from uh, VJ. VJ uh, sends uh, really like a, a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, POC on helping people just use IPFS. And things exploded. Uh, things exploded because we immediately thought of what we could uh, add to it, how we could develop it, how we could make it in a proper uh, product and then into a protocol. And uh, yeah, um, the rest is history. Super nice. Yeah, one could say you and Constantine go way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which Christmas was this, by the way? Because it's Christmas again, right? So how long, how many Christmases have you worked on five, uh, five years now? So uh, now it's going to be the second. Um, so we started in, officially we started the work um, around April 2022, 2022, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the first uh, uh, POC by uh, VJ came uh, during Christmas uh, 2021, towards 2022. Uh, so yeah, we're we're closing our year and a half, uh, uh, reaching two years now. Cool. And yes, you said earlier that despite the fact that you kind of work in AI, kind of your largest concerns are not around AI; they are around kind of how we collaborate, or at least this is kind of like what it sounded like. What's the thing that you're taking issue with? Okay, so uh, there is definitely a strong relation with the issues that uh, I'm talking about and AI and how we solve it uh, at Fowler. So I'll just give you a, um, a general picture and then we can maybe uh, dive in uh, deeper into uh, what I mean. But uh, it's something that uh, both VJ Constantin and I noticed at the very beginning uh, before we even started thinking actively about building something, which is that there is a strong point of centralization, the remaining point of centralization, if you want to say it like that, in crypto, which is how people collaborate and communicate with each other. We're a whole industry that is um, ensuring that people can have computational and data integrity in their financial transactions. We've built amazing, what I like to call community computers, those blockchains, uh, and yet, we're not leveraging them for something that is non-financial but essential to the way that crypto evolves, which is uh, dissemination of public knowledge, communication, etc. So uh, this is for the crypto specific, but uh, it's shocking that this is a case in crypto because we have those values in the uh, crypto community. But the problem is much more general. The problem is uh, global. Anyone who uses the internet abides by a server client model. Uh, this is something that people uh, see as, you know, the status quo uh, today on the internet, but the internet did not used to look like this even 15 years ago. Uh, I like to use that example that until 2010, a third of all internet traffic was peer-to-peer, -peer, was purely BitTorrent links being shared between individuals. Um, and this is quite important because we uh, took a radical turn into something that is much more centralized. And now the whole world depends on three big companies for the storage of their data, the uh, recovery of their information. They're dependent on, you know, an arbitrary decision made by some a Google engineer in California that had a bad day and thus decided to delete uh, customer's data. Uh, we're dependent on a server going down uh, uh, every now and then at, at AWS and my Roomba cleaner not working anymore because of it. Um, so there are points of centralizations around servers usually based in uh, the US, uh, which come with a series of endemic issues, including lack of privacy, uh, predatory models of mining your personal data, selling it to a hundred different data brokers you have no idea even exist, uh, manipulation of your attention, of your mood, all those things. So we want to take that away uh, and redistribute it to, to people. Do, do you know which proportion of internet traffic 
um, is peer-to-peer -to -peer today? It's a very good question. Uh, I think it's, so last time I checked, I need to remember the source as well. Uh, it's my academic side. I don't want to throw things uh, without uh, proper backing. Uh, I don't remember exactly. I think I read something like less than 8%. Um, yeah, something like that. So, uh, I, can, I can specify it next time or online. Okay. And um, the three internet companies, just for the record, They are AWS, Google, and I assume Microsoft, or who is the third one? Yes, yes. Those, those were the companies I was thinking about. But, you know, you have some auxiliary uh, actors uh, that are maybe not at the same scale, but are uh, quickly closing in and capturing a lot of uh, consumers into their pre predatory model. Yeah. Why do you think this consolidation of the market has happened? So uh, this is a great question. I'll be I'll be honest, even if it uh, if it sounds like uh, it's something that would limit people from even looking at uh, Fivers, which is UX. Uh, for me, this is where it uh, starts and ends. Uh, this is something that's uh, the main focus of our team uh, at Fivers. We want to improve the UX of uh, people uh, collaborating, coordinating uh, online. Um, I think the reason why those companies uh, reach that level of um, quasi-monopoly is because they offered users the ability to abstract away a lot of the complexities uh, that were involved in, let's say, email protocols. Google comes in, uh, tells everyone, hey, PGP is cool, uh, your email protocol uh, Uh, using Thunderbird is, uh, is cool, but uh, you need to specify a million different things. You need to be aware of uh, spam. You need to be aware of all those things. How about we take it all away for you? We also give you a way to recover your information that is not just dependent on you losing your password or not. Uh, we automatically take care of the server, give you guarantees in, even if you don't pay our server. So Amazing UX. They just made uh, something that was revolutionary into something that is revolutionary and easy to adopt. Uh, and we like to use that analogy at Favors because we're taking something that is already revolutionary, blockchains, smart contracts, but we're trying to make them into something revolutionary for everyone else in the world. Uh, my grandparents included. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm totally with you that user experience is, is currently um, not what it should be uh, for Web3 products. And uh, we'll get into that in just a bit, but kind of spell it out for us a bit more. So kind of Google offers this amazing user experience. So kind of like a fully um, wide glove surface for kind of like um, reading, answering, storing your emails. How, how do they make a living off of this? And clearly they, they are making um, a very decent living. A killing. Yeah, uh, they're making a killing, that's for sure. So um, there, are a few, there are a few things about their business model. I'll focus on the one that allowed them to have such an amazing UX. Uh, and the thing that allowed them also, that created the path dependency for them, uh, um, around something that we consider predatory today. So they made everything free at the beginning uh, in order to ensure that they could get, um, they could establish the foundations for a new kind of business model at the time, you know, beginning uh, 2000s, around data. What Google realized, because they were building a search engine uh, at the beginning, is that There is a lot of public and private data that is being uh, that that is being sent around the, the internet, and the private data doesn't have much value associated to it at the moment. So what they decided to do is we're going to take people's private data, semi-private data. We're going to tell them that you, they can store as much as they want of it on our servers for free, but in a very long and legalese full uh, uh, terms and condition, we'll make sure that uh, we can use that data for our own purpose, uh, and specifically in order to make uh, some money. 
So uh, Google created this big market of data brokers that buy people's personal data. And that personal data doesn't have to be necessarily the content itself of whatever you sent uh, via an email or stored on Google Drive. It is also the metadata, which arguably is so much more important. Uh, I remember that quote by... Um, by the uh, by, uh, NSA operator that helped uh, catch Bin Laden, which is that 95% of all the work that they needed was open source uh, and on Google, uh, and it just required them to piece things together. So uh, most of that data that he was talking about was location, um, address book, was uh, time of uh, uh, things being sent. So all that is metadata. They're taking that data, they're selling it to a market that they created of data brokers that need that data in order to sell a product, in order to uh, do better identification of uh, categories of users, in order to sell that data then to other companies again. Um, it sounds okay maybe in principle, doesn't to me, uh, but this creates a lot of uh, endemic issues. I think in the US it's still so prominent in the EU, you know, we have the GDPR, it reduced a bit uh, the amount of uh, predatory uh, uh, things that come from that model. But in the US, you can buy millions of people's uh, cell phone data, you can track them uh, around the country, you can corroborate their interactions with other data points, and infer a million things from that. And it's as easy as spending $150 uh, on some website. It's not okay. Yeah. Sorry, you see, uh, we get passionate. Uh, so uh, <laughs> we, we're going to use some big words, maybe like predatory. No, I, I clearly see why you think this is, this is super important. I think there's a couple of things that kind of, I would kind of like to keep track of here. So kind of one thing is kind of how could this be tackled without blockchain? And then kind of why did you decide to kind of go the blockchain route, right? Because basically even without um, using blockchains, you could, you could offer a service that kind of is not exploitative in that sense um, and uh, kind of uh, doesn't sell your data that way. Um, so I'm thinking of services like, say, ProtonMail or similar. Um, why do you think they, they don't have more traction than they do? than they actually do. Do people not care? So uh, I'll start, but I, I see VJ uh, twitching a bit. So I know that he has, a, he has a big speech prepared for this, but I'll start by <laughs> maybe rejecting your premise, um, kind of re rejecting your premise. Specifically, I think that more and more people care. Uh, you look at the Signal app user base, it's been exploding for the past two years. WhatsApp, which is that mega app that everybody uses for uh, communication, it started end-to-end -end encrypted. It started with all the uh, right values until it was bought by Facebook. And now, you know, still end-to-end -end encrypted, but mm, there are a few things that uh, ring people's uh, yeah, uh, paranoia. Uh, same for ProtonMail. Amazing team. Um, uh, they do a lot of the right things, uh, I think, and their user base has been growing uh, quite significantly for the past two years. So there is really a movement which we want to capture, and that's our, you know, our first audience after the crypto people. It's the privacy conscious uh, individuals, and that category is growing massively. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's growing and people are, uh, care more and more, especially, you know, everything, everything is um, to our advantage uh, because you continue with the, the model we currently have, leaks are going to continue to happen. It's just about how big of a leak or a fuck up will happen for more people to take that radical step of, okay, I abandon Facebook. Uh, so uh, on that side. And then on the tech side, I think most of those companies are, uh, so ProtonMail, for example, are doing uh, um, what I consider 95% of the correct choices, uh, but they're still server dependent. Uh, I think their servers in this, uh, are in Switzerland. Uh, I remember a year ago they received a uh, warrant 
um, forcing them to uh, open up uh, one of their server. Of course, everything was end-to-end -end encrypted, but it freaked out a lot of people, a lot of their users. I remember receiving the, the email. And this is something we want to remove. We want to remove the server. We want to remove the need for a server for authentication and authorization. And this is where I, I stop and I let Vijay uh, give you the, the better explanation. Uh, yeah, so like one thing which I've seen like blockchain do very well is uh, basically like there is one property in blockchain like that excited me and the reason why I like find it very interesting that it can be used in different places. One of those is like it makes it very easy for people like, for example, like you and me to agree on things. Now, what does that agree on things mean? Uh, in this case, like let's say if you do a transaction on either Gnosis or Ethereum or any of these chains and you send a transaction hash, that's a cryptographic proof of something that you did computationally, right? Uh, and that computation in this case uh, signifies that you did a value transfer from one address to another uh, for now with all the different things uh, that we see. Uh, we can go and verify it on Etherscan, we can go and verify it on public infrastructure, or we can even run our own nodes to verify that that thing actually happened or not, right? Until now, this happens for finance. Uh, now, how does that happen for finance is, for example, we go ahead and update token balances and all of these things. That's how you have entire DeFi and everything else happening on top of it. But what we are doing is we're doing similar thing, but for data. Now imagine this uh, like uh, cryptographic proof you were able to give for your own data, like first create for your own self, and then second, also share it with other people saying that, okay, now you can also go and check the access or check the document without me intervening in that process, right? Uh, so there are different other patterns that open up. Those patterns are, for example, you sent tokens to someone, now you can never revoke access to that document. This is one of the like uh, key benefits that you get. The other way is like you can have, for example, temporary permissions or time log permission that is uh, visible on chain and everyone knows. It's not just one server or one person controlling all of those uh, things for everyone and so on and so forth. So it's it's that base assumption and the things that you can build on top of it uh, is what we are enabling uh, with the use of blockchain. And one uh, like interesting thing which I'll uh, say that would uh, like I think uh, uh, highlight how interesting the work is and why it's like very crucial for the next step that we are taking by moving away from this kind of infrastructure is if you go to Proton Mail and you lose your keys you won't be able to gain access back to it, back of it, right? But if you take a look at the blockchain, it's a core premise that you should not be able to lose your keys. Uh, so to give an example of the same work that SAFE did with Recovery Hub, to give an example of uh, uh, one of the EF uh, work that me and Andres were working on uh, for like allowing people to recover access to a smart contract in a low, uh, like, for a low risk, uh, in a low risk method. Uh, so it's all of these things that actually come together that wouldn't be possible if we didn't use uh, blockchain uh, to like leverage as a like as an advantage, in my opinion. This is super interesting. I think this is the first time I've heard someone say that kind of the advantage of blockchain is that you can't lose your keys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I get back to that. In, in in just a second. So there's a very obvious kind of um, question here, right? So storing data on blockchain is notoriously expensive. So kind of how do we make that work with, uh, with fi Fileverse? Beauty of uh, content addressing. We're not storing the, the whole file itself. Yeah, we're, we're storing the, uh, the content hash uh, onto the blockchain, which is just a pointer to a file. Uh, and that pointer ca comes with uh, some properties of self-certification, which we consider uh, crucial for what we're building, especially for public data. So you want to be able to see 
and have that um, data integrity prove that this information came from that person and we're absolutely sure of it because we have a formal proof that VJ stamped that data with his uh, uh, key and that data generated uh, hash that anyone can verify and can verify that no future or no uh, new edits or um, changes happen on that data. So uh, those properties are quite important. This is what we use uh, blockchain for. We're making sure that those hashes are stored on chain, uh, available for anyone. And, and this is what uh, VJ meant with uh, not losing uh, your keys. Uh, you can store it in, for example, a smart contract and make sure that that smart contract is being controlled by multiple people. Maybe just one person, but with multiple series of uh, key pairs uh, and, uh, you know, with some rules that are publicly viewable by anyone and triggerable by anyone. So this is something that we're, um, that VJ and I are working on uh, uh, for, the, for the Ethereum Foundation. We have a mechanism, for example, that let's say that uh, Andreas and Frederike uh, decided that um, the, there are too many scientific publications that disappear every year from the internet. And this is an uh, important loss for humanity. So uh, we decided to put a lot of that data on IPFS or RWIF and store those hashes on the blockchain to make sure that it's always available to everyone. Andreas and Frederike might disappear. Uh, but they want to make sure that this public data, this public good, remains available and recoverable by someone else. So they make sure that on that smart contract where they, they, uh, they store the hashes of that content and through which they pay for the storage of that content is recoverable by a public community. Um, so yeah, this is uh, some of the work that we're doing and it's not something that you can do with any centralized server that depends on you maintaining it. I think in, the, in that context, it makes a lot of sense. You already said that kind of like the actual data gets stored elsewhere, namely on kind of protocols such as IPFS or Arweave. Remind, remind us um, how they make sure that the data actually stays around. Okay, uh, so in the, the way that we have done uh, right now in terms of uh, in the in the way that we have uh, structured our so like uh, structured our nodes or the way that we allow people to uh, host their data right so what we do is we have a storage node let's say and that storage node does pinning for that person uh, in this in case of fireverse this storage node is something that we are running right now for all our users but Later on, what we have is like you can actually run it on your local machine. You can run it on your uh, own AWS instance. You can run it on your uh, like some cloud that you just hosted that you're hosting in your home and so on and so forth. So what it does, it uh, like that storage service pins that data. There is a concept called pinning in IPFS, uh, which keeps that data on those nodes right the beauty of this concept of pinning and uh, like why this kind of thing actually makes sense is that anyone can come in and participate either in the storage of those pins or can come up with uh, for example things that can work on top of uh, uh, like can do the transfer from one system to another uh, without worrying about if data gets uh, clogged or like lost in the middle right uh, so to give an example of that how that looks like uh, is that you can uh, have a ipfs hash that is pinned on one machine then you have another machine that pulls that data from that machine and then starts pinning it for that uh, on on the different machine right so you get right to exit from one server which is let's say hosted by us and then you can uh, actually start doing the pinning for your own self and all your own smart contract Okay, but basically, if I don't want to host stuff myself, I just want to use IPFS as a service, how do I make sure um, not all the nodes that kind of, because not all the nodes store all the data. I think this is kind of like the crucial difference to kind of like 
blockchains, right? So basically, you have you every node kind of stores a subset of the data. So kind of how do I make sure that uh, my document um, doesn't get dropped um, from the network by by way of kind of all nodes that kind of used to store it, no longer storing it or no longer being online? Yeah, it, mainly financial incentive. It's cool because it, it really allows for a self-sovereign type of uh, um, uh, experience uh, uh, of the of the internet and uh, data storage and management, because you can uh, pick and pick and choose or mix and match different uh, providers of uh, data storage according to your needs. So if you're someone that really wants to ensure that your data will never disappear. You give a 200-year uh, uh, financial incentive for a network that is specified for long-term user uh, um, storage, like Arweave. So instead of going the IPFS route, you might want to have better permanence guarantees and uh, pay upfront something that is so much cheaper than doing the same activity on Google Drive. So on Arweave, for example, uh, after five years, four years, 0.5 of storage on the Arweave uh, uh, network, uh, you are more cost effective than storing that same data for 4.5 years on Google Drive. And from there on, it's free. So you paid for a 4.5 years equivalent to Google Drive on Arweave, and then you know that you have that data there for 200 years because of the incentive mechanisms uh, of the network. One last point about that, uh, going back to what you said, how do I know, how do I make sure? This is another benefit of uh, what we like to call community computers. You get a formal proof that you can query, that you can you know, ensure every day that it's there, that your data is stored on a specific hardware uh, somewhere in the world. Um, that proof is undeniable, unbreakable, and unspoofable, uh, which is very important for someone uh, that wants to ensure that their data is uh, still up there. So yeah, you have that proof instead of a promise by a company saying, yes, so we have your data, but also according to section 7.3 of our terms of conditions, we can drop that data if there is a picture of uh, a naked bot on it. Uh, little do they know that this naked bot is your newborn baby, you took a picture, it's on your uh, Google Drive, and now you're not allowed to use the service and you all your data is deleted. Um, I, I use that example because it happened a year and a half ago uh, with someone using Google Drive. Um, yeah, so yeah, that, that cryptographic proof plus a, a financial, an incentive system that uh, works pretty well. Why is it so much more expensive to store things on Google? Is it just because they have an insane profit margin or are there some um, are there some deeper underlying causes? I will point at the fact that uh, there hasn't been much change in the pricing of uh, data storage uh, in those quasi monopolies. For one reason, they're quasi monopolies. They do not need to abide by market uh, demand conditions dynamics. Uh, meaning there isn't a race between different providers like there is in uh, different uh, Filecoin, Filecoin nodes competing with each other to either provide the best service in terms of UX or provide better pricing uh, for their users. Here, when you know that you're the only person that uh, people uh, or the only company that people will knock uh, at the door of in order to get a certain service, why are you going to... Uh, you know, compete with yourself uh, uh, towards a, a more uh, a cheaper or more efficient or better uh, UX. You're already there. But there are quite a f quite a few cloud service providers. So it's not just Amazon or Google. It's also Microsoft and then kind of like smaller ones like Hetzner and local ones. So it should it it seems like if if any one of them were to kind of break um, the price barrier here they would all have to follow at some point, right? Um, so I, I'm, not, I'm not sure why that's not happening if, if, if storage is actually much, much cheaper. 
Well, because they're all focusing. So uh, this is me going into, uh, this is not a fact. This is uh, a reasoning, uh, educated reasoning. Um, so AWS compared to Google Drive are focusing on different types of markets, uh, different types of users. Um, AWS has a, a quasi majority. I think they have 66% of all uh, uh, server usage uh, and, uh, and uh, data storage. But this is much more for businesses, for developers, for ML engineers, etc. Google Drive and the Google servers uh, have, uh, and same for Microsoft uh, Office, have a direct to consumer focus uh, with their data storage and their servers. And they're basically just, uh, those two together are uh, two thirds of the market for, um, for data storage uh, for consumers. So yes, there are other players. Uh, they're fighting for a much smaller uh, chunk of the pie. Uh, and usually they're, they're focusing on a part of the pie that is much more specialized. So it's a part of the pie for uh, consumers that are very focused on privacy preservation or guarantees. Um, so they allow themselves to have a different pricing uh, method because they know that what they're providing is not just better pricing but uh, or not at all better pricing but just better ux or guarantees that meet their audience's needs uh, but if you were to take all that market together put them all uh, under one big category a system where you have millions of nodes, millions of providers competing with each other uh, to meet the needs of their users, meaning either pricing or UX or privacy guarantees, you would have a different dynamic is my, uh, my uh, interpretation and uh, different pricing models. Here, because you have quasi-monopolies, even though there are a few competitors, those competitors are not uh, fighting those quasi-monopolies on pricing. They're fighting them on some uh, marginal improvements that are very important for a certain subset uh, of users. This is how I see it. I, I want to see an efficient market person kind of debate this because to me it sounds like, like because it's such a huge market, it's it should be a an enormous business opportunity to kind of just drive down the pricing here. There, there is also one important element to that, which is um, people are not just coming for storage. They're coming for the usage of an app or a, a feature, a Google Doc, a Google Sheet. And uh, those companies have created an ecosystem where everything that is your essential need when, you, uh, when you're uh, online or you're doing activities online, relates back to their uh, storage space. So competitors that might emerge would need to also compete on the full stack of features and tools. So it, it explains part of it. But uh, I, I hear the I hear the, the concern. Yeah, I, I think I think the full stack explanation makes a lot of sense to me. So um, you guys um, are leveraging smart contracts yeah. um, to kind of point at um, existing file storage protocols. Um, if you kind of look at what a Google Doc does, it kind of gives you an infinite number of points in time that you can go back to. Obviously, kind of if you need to store every one of them as kind of a pointer in a smart contract, that's expensive on kind of, you know, the, the, the smart contract fees. It's also expensive because you need to store each one of those kind of as a separate IPFS or Rweave document. Yeah. Um, how how do you go about that? Uh, yeah, so the interesting part in that is basically there are two types of things. Uh, when the data is at rest, uh, rest being uh, that rest state being, for example, like, uh, okay, I have finished, I'm finished with this document. Now I want to publish it or put it out there, share it with the people that can actually take a look at it and so on and so forth. That's when we put the data on chain, right? Uh, before that, we use a peer-to-peer -peer database called GUN. And uh, what it does, like it creates the cryptographic proof for all those updates that are happening 
and then it makes sure that those updates get transferred uh, between the peers that are connecting to filewares and actually help share the bandwidth or the updates with all the other peers to reduce the latency in general. Uh, so uh, basically there are two types of systems. One system is on-chain storage, another is off-chain storage. The off-chain storage is peer-to-peer -peer and shared amongst the clients that are connecting to the system, connecting to the document and so on and so forth. And then there is another system which is when you want to publish and push the things on-chain or share it with other people, that's when you push it uh, on-chain with the fingerprint uh, method. Okay. Um, and then you also alluded to the fact that kind of I can share it with whoever I want for however long I want. H how do you how do you implement that kind of um, is it on the smart contract basis or is it on um, the file storage um, system? Uh, so uh, basically there are, are two, three different cases of permissioning as we uh, implement, as we had implemented. Uh, one of them is like you have a document, now you want to share it with someone, you generated the keys related to the document, pushed it on chain, shared the uh, thing with other person. Uh, that happening either through NFT or through contract is something uh, that uh, we can say that abstracted out for the sake of the simple discussion, right? And then we have uh, the other way, which is like you want to have the revocable access, meaning you give access to someone and then you want to revoke it after some time. Uh, in that case, like we have something uh, called, it's, it's still something that we are working on or experimenting on. So I'm sharing a bit of a forward thing uh, here. So it's sort of an UTX so approach, like unspent transaction output approach. And then you, once the transaction is executed either through a smart contract or through someone else, that's when you lose access to the document or things like that. So there are different paradigms that we are uh, like implementing and using uh, and are possible because of the smart contract and us being able to trust someone for uh, being able to share the access or revoke the access without it being done through one of our servers. Okay, so if you look at um, the product as it is today, maybe this this is a question for Andreas. Um, what um, what does it offer me? Um, how can I work on it? How can how can I collaborate using it? And how does that compare to Google Docs, for instance? Okay, so um, I like to think of it more as a Google Workspace as a whole. Uh, so inside of it, you have Google Docs, you have Google Drive, Sheets, etc. Why? Because this is really the suite of tools that we're trying to provide. So today you arrive on uh, Fileverse. Right now we're uh, a permission based, so uh, your address needs to have certain characteristics, uh, and it's for us to better manage our, our uh, initial uh, uh, user base and uh, uh, core users, improve the UX, and then open it uh, for the world to join. So if you have permissions, you arrive, you create your uh, account in two clicks. Those clicks, what do they do? Uh, very similar flow to SAFE. The SAFE multisig, you deploy your smart contract. That uh, smart contract will serve as uh, your repository of, um, of uh, content hashes and will be doing access permissioning for anyone that you give access to your files to and what type of access. Once you've uh, done those two clicks and deployed the smart contract for free, uh, there is a dashboard that opens up in front of you, uh, a UI. That UI is not stored on our uh, server only, you can access it through any public IPFS gateway. So you never need to interact with, uh, with Fileverse ever again from the moment you've deployed a smart contract. You have a UI that allows you to upload files, store them publicly or uh, privately. If it's private, you can choose token gating, you can choose uh, anyone with the link, or you can say uh, uh, any of those 10,000 addresses in my CSV can access my file, etc. Basic storage uh, and permissioning. You have also a bunch of plugins. And this is probably the most exciting thing that Falvis is doing. Um, we like to think, or we like to communicate the idea that you can think of your workspace 
as something as customizable as your browser. Today, a lot of people are customizing their browser experience or their internet experience by adding extensions. I have, you know, uh, the Internet Archive, I have MetaMask, I have a bunch of others, um, Grammarly, etc. Uh, and we want to do that for your workspace, for your collaboration space. So instead of having a Google workspace or a notion that is limited to whatever new feature the developers uh, have decided they should push on the users, here you have um, a store, let's say, where you can drag and drop new plugins. Today, the plugins are developed internally, but we're already starting to see people uh, propose new plugins uh, for the dashboard. So. Uh, lawyer versus uh, Frederic uh, versus a meme lord like me uh, will want to have a different workspace and different tools uh, to create, uh, be productive, etc. So right now you have a whiteboard. Uh, anyone who uses Excalidro would love that feature on Fiverr. It's just like uh, Excalidro. You can invite people on it as well to collaborate live with you. Uh, and the difference is that you can create as many whiteboards as you want. Whereas for Excalidro, there is a limit of five different pages that you open. Here you can as many as you want with groups, without groups, etc. Uh, you have also a DDoc, decentralized docs um, uh, plugin. So it acts like Google uh, uh, Docs. Uh, you have mostly the same UX with a few differences, like you can token gate or uh, people joining you and uh, that are editing your file uh, can retain their anonymity or be represented through their wallet address or ENS. And you have another, uh, that's our latest plugin, which is called DPages, Centralized Pages. Uh, you, you'll see the pattern. Um, that act like a Notion. So you click on that plugin and you open up a blank page that has exactly the same uh, characteristics as you have today on Notion. You can create tables, tables within tables. You can do cord, uh, uh, coding or uh, code markdown. Um, you can embed images, videos, tweets uh, on that page. You can put a cover picture. You can customize it as much as you want. So on that, you can really do anything from blog posting to having your internal database uh, or knowledge base or if and this is where interestingly enough most of the companies that came to us uh saying hey we would like to use fivers because we want to use a decentralized version of everything that we use uh they've been very interesting in deep interested in deep pages specifically for documentation uh governance and uh knowledge bases why because they, they realize that if notion goes down tomorrow or uh, whatever other service they might be using, like Gitbook, that's it. There is 10 years of crypto knowledge, discussions, interactions with the community that has disappeared forever. Um, so this is where we intervene, and this is what uh, most uh, actually enterprise, let's call it clients, have come to us uh, to address. Okay, and how do they pay for this? I mean, do they pay for the on-chain storage directly? And how do they pay for your services? Because you're kind of just, um, you're just an interface to the, those um, services. So w w what's your business model as Fiverr's? Uh, great question. Um, a few things. One is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we're not going to go into this with, hey, uh, we're pricing it according to the number of words you write. Um, we're going with uh, something that is quite similar to existing uh, models. So it's either based on storage, uh, storage space, or based on uh, specific features that you might want to get, like, uh, and this is me already giving uh, some uh, secret details of what's coming uh, soon, but uh, let's say you want to have a local LLM, uh, help you either generate images or uh, synthesize a report for you or help you write something. Um, those are special features that you would need to unlock by either paying or etc. Right now though, Fiverr is uh, in allow list mode and everything is free. 
So uh, we want to make sure that the the first iteration of Favors, what we're working on uh, right now, is just something that blows everyone away in terms of UX. And for that, we decided to focus on, uh, there are over 7,000 unique addresses that are recurrently using uh, Favors at the moment. Those individuals are for us the opportunity to nail the UX. So we're not pushing a business model onto them. Uh, and we want to ensure that even when we do, and it is either storage-based or feature-based payment, we want them to know that whatever happens, they can continue using the service and paying uh, through alternative uh, paths. For example, instead of having your data replicated on three nodes and that managed or paid to Favors directly, you do that yourself on our weave through the same UI and through the, the contract that you deployed. Or you want to, you really like Pinata or the IPFS uh, uh, ecosystem, you use Pinata. Uh, or you want to store everything locally. Perfect, your smart contract and the UI were made for you to customize your needs in terms of storage and never be dependent on a team that might disappear tomorrow. Um, so yeah, this is the customizability even on the business model side. And we think that we're gonna, going to be attracting a lot of people that do indeed want to have those options and you know uh, an ecosystem of plugin where they know it's not the Fiverr's team that created this new, uh, this new plugin, but it's someone else and I can pay that developer uh, myself, yeah. Nice. And you said earlier that kind of you're striving to kind of make the best UX possible. Uh, you, you actually said that you want your grandparents to use this. Currently, web-free products are notoriously difficult to use. How do you achieve that? Or do you think you're there already? So uh, I think we're halfway there. Uh, I think already, and this is, this is probably my, uh, my favorite success story uh, with Fiverr's. Uh, which is that um, at my university department, uh, a lot of people, if not the majority, are quite skeptical about uh, the value of blockchains uh, and anything crypto uh, associated. And I presented our, uh, our product uh, to them without mentioning anything uh, blockchain about it, just you know, talking about data and computational integrity, recovery mechanisms, group ownership and trustless interactions. And people really liked it. And it was a version where you didn't have to connect any wallet. And people used it and people really liked it. Uh, then I said, I dropped the B word and they were like, ah, yes, but you're burning the planet uh, by uh, by using those docs. Um, so uh, what's... What's really, I think, uh, our, our um, main contribution to the crypto space is that we're pushing non-financial applications. And those non-financial applications have an extremely low barrier to entry, even if we don't have the best uh, uh, UI or UX at the moment. Why? Because we removed a huge barrier, which was you need to have a wallet. In that wallet, you need to have tokens. For you to have tokens, you need to go through a centralized exchange. For you to use that centralized exchange, you need to give uh, your ID. Uh, you need to pass KYC. You need to give the color of your cat. You need to tell them how many times you go to the toilets per day. Uh, you need to do all those things that are quite ridiculous, that, are, uh, that destroy any trace of privacy for anyone that starts interacting with the crypto world. Like we, we want to, like the space in general wants to push self-sovereignty, privacy and uh, ownership onto people. And yet their first stop in order to join our industry is through a centralized exchange, is through buying tokens. That's not, uh, that's not okay. That's not uh, going to be sustainable. We want to have that one-stop entry where you don't need anything. You just need to want to... Uh, Create a doc, share something with someone. Uh, that's it. It's daily activities people already have on the internet. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to provide that with better guarantees of privacy and ownership. How do you log in then without a wallet? Okay, so 
there are a few things. Uh, the first iteration of Favors, it was just, you can think of it as an alternative to WeTransfer. You would uh, arrive, you'd upload the file, you would share it uh, immediately. No wallet uh, needed. Your identifier is basically just uh, your browser. Things happen client, uh, uh, client side, and that's it. Today, with uh, the current version of, uh, of uh, Favors, it is wallet-based, but you have options to go without a wallet um, that are coming very soon. It's the work that we're doing uh, uh, in parallel also uh, uh, for the Ethereum Foundation, and it's the famous social login. Um, so social login is something that happens on your browser level, on client side, uh, uh, you you can so depending on the on the path that we take, uh, you'd be able to, for example, use your email as your identifier, or use let's say an existing key pair, your PGP key pair, in order to uh, associate a wallet uh, to it in an efficient and non long setup seed phrase blah 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 way. Or you can do something else, which is this is what we call internally the Argent. A path which is put two, three phone numbers of your friends or yourself or your family. Uh, they will now become the guardians of uh, the access to your data and uh, to all that in case you either lose it or you just want to uh, fast uh, log in. So there are a few paths, uh, and one that already exists today is, but it does require a bit of a setup. You can create Filevers, uh, Filevers smart contract via the safe multisig today, via safe multisig, so the safe uh, user interface. And uh, thankfully, safe shipped also social logins. So now you can, you know, with a, with an email, uh, login directly onto uh, Filevers if you go through the safe uh, UI. Cool, perfect. So unfortunately, we are almost at time. I need to wrap up. But what's coming for Fileverse in, in, in this new year? Yeah, uh, great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, there are a few really exciting things that are coming, including uh, things focused around uh, UX. So we want people to be able to log in finally just in one click uh, and without having necessarily to go through the mental exercise of creating a wallet, etc. So this is coming. Uh, we have better recovery mechanisms that are coming. Uh, we have something that is core to something we've been uh, we've been focusing a lot of our efforts on, which is customizability of data storage, even more than there is uh, today. And uh, there is also a lot of new plugins coming in. Um, I just want to mess uh, to uh, mention in passing that VJ is the co-creator and organizing of She Builds, uh, which is the uh, biggest um, non-male focused uh, hackathon event and and uh, an uh, organization in India. Um, and we have not only a lot of participants that are learning what Web three is all about, but um, we've had a lot of people already uh, start proposing new plugins and ways for them to monetize their plugins uh, via Favors. So this is going to be very exciting because you're you're seeing really the seeds of Favors becoming something that is not just VJ Constantin Andreas and uh, the team, but something that is that has been completely readopted, reappropriated by anyone who wants it. Uh, and go into into a full community play. So those are a few things I'm excited about. Uh, VJ probably has uh, maybe different things. Uh, yeah. So one uh, key thing which would sort of uh, like answer one question that you were alluding to, like how do you make sure that the IPFS hashes that you have published on chain actually stay around? So those are different kind of uh, like uh, that's that's a very interesting and unique. Uh, problem that we have just because our storage is decentralized, right? And this problem has been solved by multiple providers, for example, Filecoin, uh, RV, and different other players in the ecosystem already. Uh, what we are thinking of is like, how can we make use of these different providers and then maybe ask them to come up with the network that supports Fileverse, let's say, network one, network two, network three, and users can pick 
between these three networks instead of you know uh, us giving them an option that okay you go with one person or the other and the best part that you get is like you get right to exit from network a to network b because of the data uh, like uh, fingerprint that is stored on chain right and you get uh, this right to exit from any of the services that we do just because of the way that we are making sure the data is stored making sure the data is shared and so on and so forth so yeah that's a that's a very interesting work uh, and uh, i think uh, that's something that's very unique as well super cool guys so for people who want to build on fileverse or just try it out um uh, how, how how does one get whitelisted to kind of use this um, right now, it's uh, direct communication uh, with us. Um, there are a few things that you can already do in order to get access. For example, if you have a safe multisig, you're automatically allow listed and you can deploy your, your filers. Um, but if you want to try it out, we have recurrent campaigns that pop up uh, every now and then. Uh, or you can really just DM filers directly uh, we re usually very open uh, uh, to that, or any one of the the, the people working on uh, on Fiverr's. Uh, and this is both for users that want to try something non-financial in crypto, or show uh, during the holidays to their family, hey, you don't need money or speculation to use uh, something in crypto. Uh, and for teams that want to build on Fiverr's, using Fiverr's, destroy Fiverr's, whatever they want. They can either go directly on uh, GitHub, they can go on Radical, or they can, again, uh, message us. We're constantly uh, uh, talking with uh, different teams, so we're happy to see that type of, uh, those types of interactions. Perfect. Thank you, guys. It's been a real pleasure. Frédéric, thank you. Thanks for all the great questions. Also for uh, uh, putting your finger where... Uh, where uh, you know the the real discussion can happen and uh, uh, things might be a bit uh, wobbly it's always a, a pleasure and yeah hope we we can return maybe in a year to show uh, how much uh, progress has been made <laughs>